What's up again, everybody? Well, the Calling Las Vegas has come and gone. The entirety, basically, of the set of Tales of Aria has been spoiled or revealed through the Tales of Aria premiere event, and this leaves only the pre-release before we fully get our hands on the set. And if you know anything about Flesh and Blood pre-releases, the pre-release format is sealed. So let's talk about pre-release sealed deck building, how to go about it, what you want to look for within this Tales of Aria sealed event, and how you can best set yourself up for success. Now before we get too far into the weeds of Tales of Aria sealed and deck building and that sort of thing, I think we should start at the very beginning. Tales of Aria is a standalone booster set for Flesh and Blood that introduces three new heroes with all new mechanics, with the set itself featuring the Land of Aria, located in the world of Wraith, where Flesh and Blood takes place. The set has 238 cards, and when you sit down to play in this pre-release event, you will get six packs with which to make a sealed pool and then create a minimum of a 30-card deck around one of the three heroes in this set. All three heroes are elemental heroes, and each hero can take advantage of two out of the three elements within the set. As you look through your card pool, you'll find Earth, lightning and ice cards as well as elemental rune blade elemental ranger and elemental guardian cards you may also just find elemental cards those are sort of the generic cards of the set that can be played by any of the three heroes whereas lightning ice and earth cards can only be tapped into by a select one or two of the heroes within the set. Let's quickly talk through the three heroes within the set. First is Lexi, the Lightning and Ice Ranger. She's a combo attacker that threatens just constant leak damage, damage that comes over the top. She threatens these on hit effects that allow you to deal more damage after the fact. So any damage that gets through triggers the on hit effect, thus triggering the possibility of more damage. She generally focuses on running yellows and other cheap cost attacks and plays cards that are absolutely terrifying, kind of like Ball Lightning. Oldham is an elemental guardian that has essence of earth and ice. He is very grindy and very setup oriented. He blocks a lot and he throws giant attacks every turn or two. You need a lot of blues when you're playing Oldham and you want to look at your cost breakpoints. You want lots of two and three cost attacks so that you can keep one blue card in hand and that two or three cost attack and then use the other two cards in your hand to block. He can do some very tricky things with his once per turn defense reaction depending on what card you pitch to trigger the defense reaction effect. Briar is the elemental rune blade hero that can be incredibly dangerous in draft and sealed because she can harness the power of arcane damage and arcane damage can only be blocked by effects that say they stop damage or arcane damage and that's not very common in this set it would appear there's a handful of equipment and a handful of cards that stop arcane damage and so if you can take stock of how many cards deal arcane damage uh, when you are opening your packs and looking at Briar, then you may be able to take advantage of that blind spot within the set. Within this set, there is one main keyword and one main functionality, and that is Fuse. Fuse is a keyword wherein after you have paid for the card you want to play, you can reveal a card from your hand that matches the Fuse effect. If you do this, then you will trigger the Fuse effect for that card. It is incredibly important to understand how Fuse actually works. Again, you are going to play the card down that you want to play. You are then going to pay for the card with a different card from your hand by pitching it. At that point, you can then reveal another card from hand, not the one you pitched, but another card from hand that actually meets the requirement for that Fuse effect. At that point, you would then fuse the card by revealing that card from hand. Okay, so now that we've gotten the general gist of Tales of Aria out of the way, let's talk specifics on how you should go about, or really just, I should say, in my opinion, because this, this is like, there are tons of ways to do this, but this is the way that I go about it. So I just do want, I want to clarify that. You could have your own methodology and it could be just as valid, if not more valid, but this is how I do this. Um, particularly for this set, I think this is probably just a really good way to organize things. So let's talk through it. 
When you open your six sealed packs, I highly recommend that you sort these into these stacks. I would sort these into stacks of class cards. So that is a stack of ranger cards, elemental ranger and normal ranger cards. As you can see here, bolt and shot is just a ranger action, but it's in with the elemental ranger things because you can't play it in Briar, for example. Speaking of Briar, um, elemental rune blade and normal rune blade cards in their own stack. And then, yes, I know it's deceptive, but these are these are about the same size stacks. I just have these sleeved up because that's the deck that I ran at the premiere event, um, all your guardian, your elemental guardian cards into one stack as well. So you have all three of these stacks, which are your class cards. Important next step, you should very, very much sort and count your element cards. That's what I'm gonna call these, these element cards. So these are all of the earth cards that are in my sealed packs. Um, these are my sealed pool, if you will. These are all of my lightning cards in my sealed pool. These are all of my ice cards. It is incredibly important to understand and know the numbers here on this row of uh, piles because these are the cards that you are going to most likely be using to fuse other cards, perhaps fusing your elemental um, class cards perhaps fusing the cards within these. But if you know that you have a large proliferation of earth cards, then that makes it that much easier to fuse other earth cards, which makes you in turn think, maybe I should play the earth heroes, the heroes that can tap into earth cards, and maybe not so much play Lexi. But then you can also look and see, oh, I do have a lot of lightning cards as well, and I have a very powerful yellow and red combination of arrows in Lexi, so maybe I do that. But knowing this number right here is hugely important. So these are what I would separate um, your cards into. And of course, finally, you have these sort of generic cards. These are elemental cards. All of these um, can be played in any of the other classes. Um, this one's not this. Oh, yeah, that is elemental action. So all of these cards are available to any of the heroes. So separate those out as well. And look at those last because those can be sort of fit into last but these six stacks are hugely important for understanding what hero you have good access to and what hero you don't necessarily have good access to of course you should also look at your equipment and look at what you have available like for example if you have the buckler the rusted buckler for a uh, guardian that's a plus but i found in this set and this is just a little small thing i found less utility in the equipment compared to other sealed sets. Like for example, in Monarch, I felt that if you found yourself with um, you know, several equipment for the same class, that's almost strong enough to just point you towards that class by itself. Whereas in this set, it's not necessarily that way. Almost all of the equipment is generic, so therefore you can tap into almost all of the equipment uh, in and of themselves. And um, all of them feel very gadgety in a lot of really fun ways, which means they don't tie you down to one class. So the equipment is important to understand, but oftentimes you're just gonna include the equipment that you have because you can. So equipment pile is necessary, of course, because it exists, uh, but don't use that necessarily to tell you exactly what to play. Do keep in mind as well where you get your majestics, what majestics you end up pulling in this sealed pool um, I only pulled one majestic it was this card it was force of nature and I compared uh, this to the other cards that I got in briar and the other earth and lightning cards and I used the knowledge of this card along with the other cards and what they did to decide whether or not I wanted to play briar these majestics do help um, add cards to the card pool for that specific hero but uh, sometimes like in this case they don't have enough support around them to really pull you towards a class. Nevertheless, keep note of where you're pulling those Majestics, or if you're lucky enough where you're pulling your Legendaries and consider uh, possibly running classes based on those. I think it's also very important to note how many Fuse cards you have in each class. So for example, if we go through the Elemental Guardian, we see Ice Fusion, Ice Fusion, Earth Fusion, Earth Fusion, No Fusion, Ice Fusion again, no Fusion, Earth Fusion, Ice Fusion, Ice Fusion, Ice Fusion, Earth Fusion. So there's a lot of uh, Fusion cards within the Guardian 
um, class that we've opened up within this sealed pool. So you would then want to compare all of those ice fusion cards with how many ice cards you both have and you think are playable. Uh, if you looked at that and then you looked at all of your ice cards and you saw, saw that, oh man, I don't have very many ice cards or you know all of them are like yellow, which is weird for Oldham in this instance, uh, but maybe good for Lexi, then you compare again the number of fusion cards that you see in Lexi to the number of ice and lightning cards. There's the lightning fusion, ice fusion, ice. You get the picture, lightning, lightning, ice, ice, lightning, ice, ice, ice. You kind of count these numbers out. You see how things fall. You take a look at um, your differing piles and you try to figure out if you have enough cards to fuse these fuse effects, to trigger these effects. If you don't, if you go, oh wow, all of these lightning cards are like, eh, some of them are really good. Some of them are not so good. Um, do I really want to play that? And you kind of think back and forth. Do I have enough ratios of um, lightning cards and ice cards or ice and earth cards? I, for example, had a large number of earth cards and a eh, kind of OK number of ice cards. And I wanted to play Oldham just to see how that all fit together. And I felt that I had enough ice and earth just barely as far as ratios are concerned to be able to trigger fuse effects. And so I ended up playing that and that was fairly correct. I was able to trigger fuse effects most of the time that I wanted to. Sometimes I didn't care, but because I counted these numbers and because I knew those numbers while I was playing my games, I was able to correctly identify when it was okay for me to pitch away an earth card versus when I really needed to hold it for the possibility of drawing a fuse earth card next turn. One of the most important things about consistent deck building within sealed pools in Flesh and Blood is resources. If you don't know what hero needs what kind of resources or how many resources, or if you don't know um, how many resources you actually have available to you, then it can sometimes run in, you can run into the issue where you sit down, you play your deck and you're like, oh, I just can't pay for anything. So when you're looking through your sealed pool understand that if you're gonna play Lexi, you're gonna want yellows generally, and you're gonna want good red and yellow attacks, things that attack that breakpoint of four. When you're playing um, Briar, if you're heavy into the earth side of things, then you're gonna wanna be able to pitch fairly consistently yellow and blue cards so that you can pay for some of the big attacks that are in the earth card pool, if you will. Uh, if you're leaning more towards the uh, the arcane side of things, because you have a lot of arcane cards in your pool, then generally pitching yellow is better. Uh, sometimes you just don't have to pitch anything, so playing reds, uh, like a ton of reds is okay. Sometimes you do have to pitch like one or two, so playing yellows is really, really solid. Always you're gonna want blues if you're playing Oldham. You should 100% count all of your blues and try to jam in as many blues as humanly possible when playing Oldham, because Oldham is just resource hungry. His actual effect is a blue pitch effect. It, pay, it costs three resources to pay it. And so if you have a lot of blues in your sealed pool, particularly in earth and in ice cards, uh, then you're pretty happy. So that would be one consideration for Olden. And you're most likely not going to have enough cards in your pool to actually build a one element deck. You're most likely going to have to kind of splash in the other element available to each of your heroes. So for example, when I played Oldham, I had a whole lot of earth cards and I splashed in basically all of my ice cards just so that I could use them for fuse effects and triggering like Snow Wonder, for example, which is a really fantastic card. Um, Snow Under have, has an ice fusion that uh, if you fuse this and if this hits, then create a frostbite token. So I would oftentimes just play every single one of these ice cards so that I can trigger that fuse effect if I landed those cards in my hand together. Okay, let's get hero specific for a minute. Let's talk Briar. If you wanna play Briar, cards you wanna look for are Bramble Spark. Bramble Spark is a fantastic way to give any of your attacks um, the arcane damage dealing effect. And if you can fuse Bramble Sparks, which is pretty easy because Bramble Spark costs zero, if you fuse this, it also gives them a buff. This card is 
super good. It's really, really good. So if you get multiple, multiple Bramble Sparks, then you should be very happy with yourself. Singeing Steel Blade is also fantastic, particularly the red. I think I did get one red. It attacks for four, it costs one. Um, when you attack with Singeing Steel Blade, it uh, deals one arcane damage to target hero. Even the blue is really good. It attacks for two, your opponent generally doesn't want to block two, but it comes across for an arcane, which is basically unblockable in this format. This Sigil of Suffering is so good. It's also really good in constructed, but in um, this format, in limited format, a rune blade defense reaction that's essentially going to deal one damage to the opponent and block for four is highly playable. Uh, these Vela Flashes, I'm like kind of okay with them. Uh, these are great ways to actually have a go wide turn in, um, in Briar, and it's because of this really tricky thing that you can do uh, let me pull out one of these non-attack action cards, like for example, Bramble Spark. Vela Flash says, if you fuse it, you can play your next non-attack action card this turn as though it were an instant. This is very important to understand because if you play Bramble Spark after this at instant speed, go again at the bottom of Bramble Spark. When that resolves, it will refresh your action point. So this card takes your action point and then you go and play this at instant speed, and this gives it back. So you've attacked with Vela Flash for, in this case, the blue attacks for three, but you've set yourself up to have a go wide turn. Um, the yellow Vela Flash attacking for four, by the way, is fantastic. Four for one, and if you can fuse it, it allows you to play Bramble Spark or any of the other non-attack action cards that have go again at the end of them. Super, super good. Stir the Wildwood can get big uh, if you allow it to. This is another way that Briar can play. She can go kind of tall as well. She's sort of the pivot class. Um, technically, Lexi can as well, um, but I think she can even more. Briar can kind of kind of go tall or go wide. Lexi is a class that really attacks the breakpoints and wants you to use your bow. The bow that you most likely have access to is the token bow, and that's Shiver. And Shiver is fantastic because you can load your bow at instant speed and then um, choose the mode of dominate and that just really push breaks it really pushes break points really really well bolton shot is one of those cards you want to look for if you can give it a buff somehow then uh, it gives it go again and if it hits you reload uh, but even just like the red bolton bolton shot here attacks for four the yellow attacks for three so it's not as good but it costs you nothing Frazzle's really scary to look at, particularly this yellow one, because you could use it for pitching and set it up late game, or you can just play it out there. If you fuse it whenever an attack would deal damage this turn, instead it deals that much plus one. Now, this effect, that much plus one kind of thing, or this deals damage to target opponent, does not trigger on hit effects. And we'll talk about that as we go through these cards. Uh, but in this instance, it's going to deal extra damage, not triggering on hit effects, but this card's really, really insane with a, a couple of other cards uh, in the in the Lexi kind of card pool. Um, Chilling Ice Vein is really good. The, the yellows on all of these arrows are fantastic. By the way, again, arrow cards have to be played from Arsenal and only if you have a bow. So you can't obviously play these in other classes, but you wouldn't want to either because you, uh, you just run these in your ranger. Uh, Ice Fusion, and if you fuse it, whenever an attack deals damage, they have to discard a card or pay one. It's just really good at threatening on hit effects. Blizzard Bolt is sort of the same way. Uh, creates a Frostbite token whenever, uh, this one's crazy, whenever an attack deals damage. So if you play this first and can give it go again, uh, then anything after this is also really powerful. Flake Out is really scary. It uh, gains Dominate naturally if you fuse it, uh, which is really good because you can also give it like plus one. Um, or you can give it plus a lot of things. The the red is five for one. Dazzling Crescendo is a beautiful looking card, and it also is really solid in Lexi in general, because if you can fuse this for zero, by the way, if you can fuse this, then you're coming across for two. The red comes across for four. This is like the uber nuts kind of card. You want this and you want to be able to fuse it. And this is the one of the cards you should definitely look for in Lexi. Overflex, any of the overflexes, but particularly red and yellow. Giving plus four to an attack is so good. This is like the one go tall card. Um, using overflex into an arrow that's been dominated by your bow is just a game winner. It's a game winner, just kind of like what Oldham can do. I'm gonna talk briefly about the um, just the general cards that you might see very easily and readily within uh, the Elemental Guardian Oldham side of things, but I am gonna point you to the Oldham Sealed kind of breakdown that I did recently on the yesterday's video if you want more in-depth 
Snow Unders are very good, uh, generally because uh, it just attacks for a lot and uh, it threatens a Frostbite token. And Frostbite tokens are fantastic. I made a, a video on Frostbite tokens and why I think they're so good. It's over on Channel Fireball. Go check that out if you want to hear more info. Biting Gale is not good. I don't like that card. It costs two and it only defends for like two, three, or four. It's too expensive. Turn Timber is good. It saved me in an entire game uh, by just showing an Earth card. You can block this uh, something out for seven. Uh, mulches are super solid overall, but they are expensive, and that's just sort of the theme of Oldham. Things are expensive, they're really good, but expensive. There's a bunch of auras in this deck that you could play, and um, they, they're they a little anti-tempo in the sense that, like, I have to pay four for this, or even, like, these auras back here, where you have to pay two for them. They're anti-tempo, and you can still play stuff on them, uh, like, on the same turn. Uh, and then play stuff on the next turn to get a benefit from it. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that you're going to need a basically a full hand in order to play some of these auras and attack on the same turn. Uh, and if you're doing that, then oftentimes you are taking a bunch of damage in the back swing from your opponent. Thump's really good. Blue Thump's okay. The red Thump's even better. Emerging Avalanche, this is one of the two two-cost auras that you kind of want to jam down and just provide a buff. The other one is Strength of Sequoia. If you can fuse either of these, it's super beneficial. Emerging Avalanche, yes, gives you a Frostbite, but even Strength of Sequoia, this is the one you really want to fuse. If you can fuse Strength of Sequoia um, as Oldham, then you're going to feel really good going forward because it makes things like, not Glacial Footsteps, but Thump. It makes Red Thump a three cost. And making that a three cost means that you can play like a Strength of Sequoia, giving that next attack plus three, and after fusing it, making this cost three. So you only need a Thump plus a blue in your hand to attack for nine with Dominate and they lose a card. This will almost always trigger. Uh, there are not a ton of defense reactions in the set. So if you can actually trigger Thump, you'll win the game a lot of the time. Uh, if you've already dealt damage. So Thump is a game winner and it's a reason you should definitely consider um, actually playing Guardian if you have several of them. I did have several of them. I played Guardian and I went four and two overall, thanks in part to Thump. So that is an in-depth look at the set. Now this is obviously not every card. This is just the sealed pool that I had, um, but that is like, I gave you as much info as I could. I tried to keep it as brief as possible, but I hope that this was some benefit to you. I hope you feel a little bit more uh, prepared and understanding of the set going into these pre-releases uh, this weekend. And I hope you do really well and have a lot of fun. This set is a lot of fun to play. It's a lot of fun to open packs for. The art is fantastic. The aesthetic is really kid friendly. Um, it's a set that I'm going to actually use to further teach my son how to play and actually take him to an event for, uh, namely because a lot of the art is very kid friendly. I mean, you're looking at like literally so tomorrow is just a girl uh, like growing a tree. Uh, and I think that really, really drives the whole aspect of this set home that it's just a lot of fun. This whole set was fun to look at and to play. It's very tricky and um, it's got some really interesting interactions within it um, that can be complex, but at its heart, it's just, I'm gonna throw cool elements at the table and we're gonna attack each other. It's a lot, of, it, I mean, it's just a blast. So I hope you guys enjoy playing in your pre-releases. And if you got something from this video, let me know down in a comment below. Those comments always are very touching and I appreciate them greatly. Anyway, as always, everybody, thanks for watching.